Hi, I'm Dr. Muscle, and welcome to Lecture 14 on Buddhism. We'll talk about what Buddhism is, as well as who the Buddha was. Of course, the Buddha is the one whose teachings Buddhism is founded upon, so we'll talk about, again, who the Buddha was, uh, what Buddhism is in general. One of the first things that will become obvious to us once we start talking about Buddhism is that there's quite a variety of versions of Buddhism. You know, there's a lot of different sects, if you will, uh, and I think the editors of the uh, textbook pointed that out. So that's a good point. Um, there is no, you know, one particular uh, Buddhist viewpoint that, that does an uh, adequate job of summarizing them all because, again, there are so many versions of it. But what we'll do is talk about some of the common threads or themes that you see amongst all the different versions of Buddhism. What are the common um, themes, right? What are some of the important elements that seem to be present in all of those versions, right? We'll talk about then sort of what's you know, what's important to the Buddhist from a moral perspective. And there's a reason why we're talking about Buddhism immediately after we finish talking about virtue ethics. So lecture 13, we had two videos on Aristotle and his virtue ethics, another ancient thinker. Um, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they are actually a little bit later than the Buddha. We'll, we'll, uh, one of the things we'll point out is that he's the 6th century BC. So, And there is a little bit, I think, of a dispute regarding the exact dates on his birth and, and death. But, you know, he's a pretty old figure. Uh, but there's some similarities then between he, he and much of what the ancients will say, especially Aristotle and his virtue ethics. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about that, particularly at the end of the lecture. We'll, again, note some similarities between Buddhism and then virtue ethics. And there's, again, a reason why we're talking about it what the Buddhists have to say about morality right now. Uh, to figure out what is most important to them, spoiler alert, are experiences of pain and suffering. To sort of unfold, you know, how that's a central issue for them, we'll discuss their famous Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths, the idea of that, and then correspondingly, the Eightfold Path, which is supposed to be kind of like a uh, directive or a recipe for eliminating, if you will, the pain and suffering that seem to plague us. <clears throat> so we'll go through all of this, talk about the four famous Four Noble Truths, the famous Eightfold Path, or also known as the Middle Way, and that's of course going to back in a similarity to the Golden Mean from Aristotle and that idea of moderation. Very, very similar. We'll talk about that. Uh, and so yeah, we'll, we'll actually finish then by discussing again the ways that virtue ethics and Buddhism are, are similar. So that's our game plan here. Let's go ahead and uh, dive in then and talk about the Buddha, who is this you know, monumental figure upon which so many people have based a large part of their lives around, right? The teachings of the Buddha. Uh, well, this character, this guy was also known as Siddhartha Gautama, and I'm going to butcher these names, and there's going to be a reason why I refer to him as the Buddha, because that's the simplest. Uh, also known as Gautama Buddha. Uh, but we'll call him the Buddha. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that he does have these other uh, you know, names that he's referred to by. Again, 6th century BC is the approximate time frame. Very interesting uh, figure. So he came from a life of privilege, uh, pretty well off, I believe. Um, his family was, you know, nobility. Actually, I like the way the um, editors of the textbook sort of describe his upbringing. So the idea is uh, he comes, you know, he's very well off and then he grows, he's, he's not satisfied with that, though. Just like, you know, as many people discover when they become wealthy, that doesn't solve all of life's problems, right? And they're still, you know, just as miserable as they were before they became wealthy. And so the Buddha realizes this, and then he goes off and actually starts meddling in the life of an aesthetic or, or one who refrains entirely from indulging in pleasure. So he goes from, like, this life of a a wealthy, uh, you know, privileged individual who indulges in pleasures and whatnot to the opposite sort of life. And he'll come to figure out then um, through trials and tribulations and, and uh, you know, talking and discussing and philosophizing uh, with numerous you know, people that the proper way is the so-called middle way, you know, not to overindulge in a life of pleasure, but not to completely remove yourself from a life of pleasure either. You need to satisfy some basic wants. Uh, but anyway, I like the way the editors sort of describe his upbringing. Uh, this is from 89 on, uh, in the text. Quote, Buddhist tradition holds that Siddhartha was born in what is now Nepal to a privileged life, but in young adulthood began feeling a deep dis dissatisfaction with his life. 
Startled, the story goes, by encounters with old age, sickness, and death, the future Buddha saw in the figure of a renouncer, one who has dropped out from society to seek liberation from life's seemingly constant suffering, a way to contend with his growing unhappiness. So he sets out on a, a journey to figure out, you know, how to become happy, essentially. And like I said, I sort of spoiled it, right? He's going to realize, well, look, uh, it, indulging in pleasures all the time, that's not going to be good, but neither is constantly refraining from them. Um, so that's the Buddha. And basically, when we flesh out Buddhism and some of the central tenets, that all feeds them from what the Buddha, the, the Buddha, or that all is derived from what the Buddha taught, okay, the Buddha's teaching. And of course, I forget, there's a, I forgot the uh, term, there's a term for the teachings of the Buddha. I think they mentioned that at the beginning of the Dharma. Yeah, Dharma, or Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A. So those are the basic sort of teachings or tenets of Buddhism. We'll write that word up here. Okay, so all, everything we're spelling out is, you know, stems from what the Buddha taught, more or less. Okay, so um, what is Buddhism or what, you know, what are some of the central, central themes here? Well, in general, you know, we want to characterize Buddhism in general as we like to do first. And then we'll get into some of the specifics. Okay, so the first first thing I reiterate that I already mentioned a moment ago is that it yields a, a great variety in terms of you know beliefs and versions. Okay, and uh, so it's hard to then characterize it, I guess, or try to define it. You know, so we'll, what we'll do moving forward is kind of try to home in on some of the, again the more prominent themes that you see amidst all these different varieties. I should say that I have a little bit of um, experience with Buddhism, not a whole lot. And don't get me wrong, I'm certainly not an expert. I will probably butcher some things here and there. You know, I don't know how to pronounce things and so on. But, uh, I, you know, I've, I've uh, been interested in Buddhism for a long time. I actually, one of the most interesting classes, I've, probably the most interesting class I've ever taken. Uh, I mentioned I took a class on Nietzsche where we just studied literally one book the entire course. That was pretty interesting. But then another, uh, probably the most interesting class I've ever taken was taught by Yozan Bose, an ordained Buddhist monk at my undergraduate institution. And last I checked, he was still teaching there. He's you know, pretty old at this point. Sorry, I didn't, no offense, Dr. Mose, if you happen to be watching this. But, you know, in, the, in his 70s, at least still um, uh, teaching to, to this day, so far as I I know. Uh, so he teaches Eastern psychology. I signed up for this class and I'm, you know, 1920 at the time. And what do we end up doing throughout the semester? So we meet twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the class is an hour and 15 minutes each time. Uh, literally the first 45 minutes of every session, you come in, I forgot what it was called, but you know, the thing you kind of kneel on or, or sit on when you're when you're meditating. So we meditated for the first 45 minutes. You get this, the lights were off. A college class, you come in first 45 minutes every session, and we would just meditate. And so I gave it my all. I always took it very seriously, and uh, you know, took the belief system in general very seriously. I mean, this guy was a Buddhist too, so you know, I uh, he it, I, he was an awesome instructor too because you know he never took offense to anything. He was very willing to not be challenged, but you know, if you had a question um, that you know was challenging to his belief system, for example, he, he didn't take offense and would take the time to uh, respond and in a thorough manner and um, you know and was obviously very well versed uh, with the history of Buddhism and so on. A very interesting class and that was again Eastern Psychology at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Shout out. Um, so that, that always really stood out and then another session at one point we went out uh, all through campus and just you know tried to be kind of in a meditative state and take in the uh, surroundings and so on and what other class would you ever do this in. And so at that time, though, you know, I tried to kind of get into it. I could never get myself to, I guess, to the level where you could appreciate or I could appreciate any benefits from it. It didn't seem like meditating, but that really worked. Um, but fast forward, you know, 20 years or so, and I, you know, I, I definitely have engaged in meditation and I've definitely seen it work as well. So the whole point there is uh, it was an interesting 
experience that class. And uh, that was my first kind of exposure to Buddhism. Um, it was very uh, interesting. And obviously in meditation, then is a central element for a lot of Buddhists. Okay. Um, sort of trying to put yourself in this very peaceful, meditative mental state. Um, and I think if nothing else, through just my own personal experience, like I've mentioned, I, I can speak to that it does calm you, if nothing else, just sitting there focusing on breathing, right, and what you're doing on, in meditating, typically. You know, you're focusing on the breathing, and that is going to calm calm yourself physiologically. It's going to relax your muscles and so on. So that, that you know, that's going to happen. And whether there's other added effects, you know, I would maintain there are. And clearly, it's been a practice that's been engaged in for thousands of years, this idea of meditation, this practice of meditation. So, um Again, that's something if, if you've tried it and it hasn't worked for you, I guess the whole point of all that was, um, you know, don't be afraid to try it again. Uh, it might work the second time around. Now, that's not to say I meditate um, every day or anything like that. In fact, it's probably only like a monthly thing at this point. But there was a period of time in my life where, you know, a couple of years ago where I was meditating six times, seven times a week, like almost daily if I could. Um, and I, and I, I always have this intention recently to actually go back into that practice and try to maintain it on a daily basis because i do think again that it's that helpful in many respects in our lives okay so uh there's a little bit of a personal experience i guess you might say with me and buddhism speaking to sort of how i have you know wrestled with it um there is an issue you know i so some criticisms with theories too of course we haven't really even dived in yet and examined the theory uh, but one of the ideas like is that we're interconnected and there's the editors point this this idea out this interconnectedness with one another and there's not really any true sense of you know your oneself right the, the, we got to lose this focus on and that's part of liberating ourselves and reaching the state of uh, nirvana that right? is losing that 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 sense of self that we constantly have and then constantly focusing on it right rather no we're just a conglomeration of various physiological drives, if you will, or, or mental drives as well, um, that come together at a certain point or something like that. And so, but that sort of mentality then always led me to question, as I would question Professor Mosley, then why even care about anything? If there's really no me per se, then what does it matter if I get run over by a semi or something like that, right? If I'm just, if there's really no I in some sense, right, and it's all just interconnected being, then why even have a, a focus on my own my own welfare right um what you know is that a a sort of mistake in our mentality would they agree with what that idea well go ahead then and go jump out in front of semi and no he did not i can't of course remember you know what he had to say in response i just remember that being a kind of issue that we would wrestle with that i would bring up to him and then he would you know have to rebut and try to re or try to offer you know the buddhist response to it but anyway, um, let's go back. I don't know how I got into all of that already, uh, but talk about, try to talk about, again, Buddhism in general, uh, having gone through my own experience with Buddhism. I, I don't mean to suggest, again, that I am any expert by any means uh, with Buddhism um, at all, uh, but I do have some experience. Anyway, so Buddhism in general, what does it focus on? As we'll see, what do you keep seeing constantly? Suffering. This the Buddhism focuses on, if we want to take nothing else out of this, the central focus is suffering, pain and suffering, and that how much that plays a role in our lives, um, typically to a, a very negative, in a very negative manner. Uh, so again, that is the chief feature of Buddhism and then what the Buddhists will focus on when it comes to their moral theory. Um, uh, and the job of the moral agent for the Buddhist is going to be essentially to try to mitigate that as much as possible, that pain and suffering. So I mentioned on the bottom of slide three here that that point about there being you know, a huge variety of uh, Buddhist schools of thought. Right? And there arguably is no essential defining feature other than, say, they're all inspired by the teachings of the Buddha. Okay. Um, but we're going to, again, home in on what I would say are some very, very common features in many of these schools. But I do, I do want to stress again that, that um, there are many, many schools of Buddhism. Some, for example, as I point out um, on the bottom of slide three, consider Buddhism a religion. 
where, whereas others don't. And I actually had this discussion, I remember, with Professor Mosig. You know, he seemed to want to suggest that Buddhism was not a religion. He did not think of it as a, as a religion. I remember that thinking at the time that that struck me as odd because I'd always kind of associated it with being a religion. And he was, uh, he made it very clear that he did not approach Buddhism or think of Buddhism as a religion. More, but more as a fundamental, I guess, way of life. Again, I don't remember the details, but I do remember him, you know, very clearly wanting to suggest that Buddhism for him was not not seen as a religion. But for others, you know, that won't be the case, and Buddhism is a, as a kind of religion for them, or they view Buddhism as a religion. Uh, and another way that Buddhists differ, in addition to their view of whether Buddhism is a religion or not, is whether or not they believe in reincarnation. When we die, do, are we um, reincarnated? Do we come back to life in a different form? Some do believe in that idea of reincarnation. Others don't. Okay. We are going to focus, like I mentioned, on some of the more common themes. With that said, let's go ahead then and talk about the Four Noble Truths. Okay. These are the essential facts of life, if you will, according to the Buddhist, okay, and hence the Buddha. Okay. We have to appreciate these Four Noble Truths if we, uh, you know, speaking in terms of morality, if we want to do the right thing, this is going to be required. Acknowledging, you know, um, having awareness of it, acknowledging and appreciating these four noble truths. Okay, first, we have to acknowledge the degree to which pain and suffering play a role in our lives, that no matter how well off we seem at any point in our lives, there's always a sense in which, you know, things aren't perfect. There's still something lacking. Okay. Uh, so there's this, again, that's even in the best times okay? but and then we clearly see all of us have had the low times and we recognize there's plenty of pain and suffering then right so first and foremost hey acknowledge the degree to which this pain and suffering plays a role in your life and how much in fact it is impacting in your life okay so the reality of suffering then secondly what is causing this we have to identify this is the second noble truth what is causing or the root of the pain and suffering that's so prevalent and problematic oftentimes in our lives. And, you know, according to the Buddha, according to Buddhism, what is that cause? Desire. And I would argue more specifically, not just desire, because there are going to be necessary desires. Again, he's not an ascetic. He's not going to say, don't indulge at all. You know, the, the moral agent ought to just completely refrain from indulging in pleasures. Rather, we have to be, it's kind of like Epicurus suggested, measured in our approach, right? Don't be overindulgent by, by any means, okay? Be on guard, always be wary of your desires and ensure that when you're gonna act on them, they're truly necessary desires, right? Not superfluous, unnecessary desires that then are gonna cause all these unwanted issues. So this again harkens back for me to the Epicurus lecture and Epicurus video. So, you know, as we talked about in the Epicurus lecture, don't, be so susceptible to say advertising and then all the unnecessary desires it creates within us okay? and then all the problems that trying to feed those unnecessary desires then yields okay? so we have to appreciate the desire is the issue specifically i would argue unnecessary desires so things that don't cater to what's essential to staying alive in other words obviously we're going to need some degree of sleep food etc right basic um wants and needs Okay, we're going to have a desire to fulfill those. Okay, that's fine. Okay, what's causing the issue, though, are these unnecessary desires. And then focusing on those, freaking out when we can't satisfy them, and so on. Okay. And then the third noble truth, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, the, they have, oftentimes in, when you have discussions of Buddhism, right, they will then, I need room for this, they will sort of highlight three basic um, poisons, if you will, or issues that are related to this suffering being an issue. Okay, so these are known as the three poisons. So we're talking about this here. Okay. So I'll go ahead. And, and this is in the middle of our cellar, under the second bullet point on slide four. So he says greed, overindulgence. So that says overindulgence, okay, and then ignorance. 
or sorry, greed. Messed that up. Greedy and being overly indulgent. And then, oh my goodness. So that's supposed to say greedy or being overly indulgent. And then we have like, what would be the word? Hatred or animosity towards others. That's actually the third one on the list. And then ignorance. Third one on my list here, as I have most of So I'm referencing this here. So these are the three basic poisons. Okay? And part of acknowledging this, right, will be a recognition of these issues okay? that are related to, again, this idea that, you know, desire is causing these issues. Okay? We become fixated on materialism, for example, and needing to have more than others and we get jealous and have certain feelings towards these others as a result when we don't have you know a 14 car garage like them or something like that right and then of course ignorance is always at play here because in our lack of awareness of the issue itself okay so to sort of remedy this truth if you will we have our third noble truth so to eliminate suffering and kind of putting the first first two together well to eliminate suffering so if you if that's what you want to do to eliminate suffering then since desire is the root of it you're going to have to eliminate desire and so to eliminate suffering you have to eliminate desire and then what's going to be the key to that to that getting rid of this right? so looking for cures to these three poisons which i don't even know if i should attempt to write these up on the board i'll probably butcher them right the three cures it's just the opposite of the poisons right aim to be generous right not to hoard things yourself but rather give things away don't be jealous and angry and hostile towards others or rather try to be loving right, towards others and then obviously try to enlighten yourself lo and behold another philosopher suggesting the import or significance of reflection thinking that's the only ticket out of this issue right are these these problems and is um, meditating on them reflecting on them and then you hopefully see the light and why generous generosity, wisdom, and love are going to help remedy again the issues associated with those unnecessary desires. Now the fourth noble truth is really him sort of spelling out, okay, this is what we need to do. Well, how do we do it? Okay, and that's known as the middle way, or maybe even more popularly known as the eightfold path. So we'll go ahead and turn to that. That's slide five. Okay. So here are the things we need to focus on to work on in order to help eliminate the unnecessary desires so that we can then suffer the least amount of, you know, suffer the least in general. Okay, so here are the things we need to focus on in order to better accomplish that. And it, it seems again very much like Aristotle focusing on virtuous habits. Right? So we see a lot of similarities here. Um, and there's three sort of categories, if you will. So I don't know how I want to do this. Five, six, seven, eight. So these first two, and this is again on slide five. Okay. So we have work on having the right understanding or view. Two is right intention. And these two together are thought to encapsulate wisdom. Okay, so these will be things you can do to enhance your wisdom, if you will, right? Become wiser and okay? focus on having a proper understanding of you, backing up, you know, reflecting on some of these things in general. Right, and then acting accordingly, focus on having the right intention at all times, not being, you know, that speaks to being, you know, not being greedy and overindulgent in pleasures and constantly focusing on yourself and being overly selfish. Right? And then we have third one, right? Speech. And the fourth one, right? Action. And then the fifth one, right, livelihood, he says. And then so 
draw a line here. So these specifically pertain then to our moral conduct, things we can do to improve, you know, for us moral thinkers here, we're interested in moral morality here, what we can do then to improve our moral conduct, okay? which will in turn, remember all of this is aimed at helping us eliminate pain and suffering through eliminating unnecessary desires. Okay? Let's focus on having the right speech. We're not going to, and there's a, a big focus on this with the Buddhists, you know, um, not having hateful speech and talking to people in a respectful, calm manner at all times. Okay, right speech and in general, then right action, you know, treating others with respect in general and so on. Right livelihood, <clears throat> don't do things that are questionable to make a living. Okay. All that then encapsulates good moral conduct for the Buddhist. And then we have right effort. Right mindfulness. Right meditation. What are all these? What are all these getting at? Uh, you might. Well, I describe them as like mental health. Um, you know what? If you focus on these, then you'll be in a good place psychologically. And I, I guess that's a good way to put it. You need to have a good attitude, good effort, okay, right mindfulness. Your mind, your you have to be in a good place, so to speak, right? And this is all going to take proper reflection. Once again, an emphasis on reflection. Uh, you have to do uh, part of that would probably entail you know meditating get your, getting your mind in a, doing things that will help get your mind in a, in a good place okay um well i guess that then right meditation is the the, the last one uh, but to me these are kind of play into each other i guess it's all of these are kind of intertwined in some sense right but this is the eightfold path famously the eightfold path i should have started by putting this up here And these are the things, again, we follow this path and the idea is it will help us eliminate the pain and suffering, or at least as much as that is possible, eliminate the pain and suffering in our lives by way of then recognizing and eliminating those unnecessary desires that are the problem. All right, so let's turn then to slide six. So provided you follow this, this eightfold path, you recognize the four noble truths, you follow the eightfold path, and, and you do those as best you can, then hopefully you can reach, and we've probably all heard of this idea, this is state of nirvana. Okay. So it's not um, somewhere, you know, it's not a place, right? It's not some place you visit. Rather, it's a state of mind or a, a state of being in, in general, depending on, again, on um, what version of, of Buddhism we're talking about. It can mean slightly different things. But for all Buddhists, it seems to re indicate, right, that point of enlightenment where you've done the things necessary to overcome the pain and suffering that were so problematic, right? You focused on desire and eliminating unnecessary desires. And you've overcome the pain and suffering that were heretofore so problematic and so there's this pinnacle this this uh, state of being known as nirvana for for pretty much all buddhists okay? uh, again this is only reached through focusing on that eightfold path and following that path so this is from 90 again this is what the editors suggest with respect to nirvana this idea of nirvana they say quote only through such a transformation can we reach nibbana, more commonly known as the Sanskrit, Sanskrit word nirvana. This is a frequently misunderstood word that literally means extinction and refers to the elimination or secession of the destructive patterns of thoughts and desires that cause us to suffer, end quote. Okay, and so for those schools, as I point out on the bottom of slide six, uh, for those who believe in reincarnation, those versions of Buddhism that believe in reincarnation, uh, the idea is then if we've reached this state of being, we're no longer stuck in that constant process of rebirth, right? We've done what we've needed to do to, to eliminate that, that process that we were stuck in. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on then to slide seven. 
we'll talk about an, an equally important and famous notion associated with Buddhism known as karma. Again, probably a term that most of us have heard of coming into the course. So this is central for most um, Buddhists. Okay, most most Buddhists will entertain this idea of karma. Um, now, and this stresses the degree to which, again, I mentioned in the introduction, the degree to which Buddhists think that everything is interconnected. That in reality, and we'll realize this if we, upon due reflection, so says the Buddhist, that upon in reality that uh, there is no meaningful essential difference between me and you or any particular things. There are no particular things. Rather, everything is interconnected and one in some sense. Uh, and so that then feels this idea of karma that everything you do is thus going to have an impact. Um, and then you can't, uh, that there, that everything is interconnected and that what you will, you do in turn will not only have an impact, but will have a, a rippling effect, right? And we'll have all, all sorts of innumerable effects that we probably can't even be conscious of, right? Because again, everything is interconnected. We're not even aware of the multitude of ways in which everything we do affects so many other things. Okay, so there's this emphasis on that, that element of nature or reality for the Buddhist. And consequently then, you get this moral imperative on the part of the Buddhist to then be extra cautious because your actions are that meaningful, right? If you believe in the idea of karma, that there is this, which rests on this idea that everything's interconnected, well, then your actions become incredibly meaningful because they don't just impact you, in this moment, but they impact, you know, billions, uh, not just, you know, human beings, but sentient creatures, and not just in the moment, but throughout all time and theory. And of course, it works the other way too. You have been affected in everything you're doing. You, we think that we're completely free and deciding and so on, but no, we're actually um, being affected then through all these other things that have happened in the past and by that have been done by others, right? So everything's interconnected. And so the upshot of that is be very mindful of what you're doing because it, what you're doing does have significant ramifications. Okay. And we'll ref so then there is also there's um, kind of an implication of this then would be be careful as well because you know you stand to the the typical um, layman version of karma right that, that also applies too. Watch out, your karma will get you, right? The idea being you screw over someone else, you're constantly um, hurting them. Well, that's going to come back and re you know, reflect back on you. And eventually it's going to come back to bite you, right? Because again, we're interconnected and what you do has consequences and it's ultimately going to come back on you. If you treat others this way, well, then they're going to end up treating you and reality is going to treat you in a similar way. All right, so the editors describe karma on page 91. They suggest, quote, in Buddhism, karma is tied deeply to the idea of interdependent arising. If everything is interconnected, it is impossible to escape the consequences of our actions as measured by their contributions to the suffering of the world. Actions then can be judged according to their merit. Do they con contribute to the alleviation of suffering or do they compound it? And so actions that, so it sounds very utilitarian almost, right? Actions that except instead of focusing on happiness, we're focusing on the opposite, suffering, right? which maybe is just unhappiness, I'm not sure. Um, you know, is an, a given action right? Yes, if it alleviates suffering. Wrong, it, it's wrong if it promotes suffering. So from all this general stuff we've said about Buddhism and their sort of general view of reality, you know, on the side of karma and the focus on pain and suffering, and that should be our our goal is to eliminate that as much as as is possible. We get then the some guidance, some advice. Okay? You might even say these are moral precepts. So the five, this is kind of famous too, the five precepts of morality, things we ought to do from the Buddhist perspective. And I think the editors pointed out that this has been expanded in more recent times in Buddhist circles uh, to include, you know, 10 different things. You know, looking through some of that, it some of them seems kind of redundant to me, but uh, I just wanted to point out that traditionally, right, there were these five precepts, and it seems like in more recent times, um, again, some Buddhists have expanded that to include up to 10 general precepts. But what are the original, the five 
you know, major precepts here. Don't harm life or living being, beings. And uh, you see all these kind of actually play out then in the story or the excerpt we read related to Buddhism and because they all become an issue. So don't harm living beings. Don't kill other people or any living creature. Don't steal. I should probably put these up here. Don't kill life. So don't steal, don't engage in sexual misconduct, and we have don't drink in excess on here, I thought don't lie was one, don't lie, and this has always been if you have any of your Buddhists out there, maybe you can chime in. But uh, are they not, you know, is a Buddhist not allowed to drink alcohol at all? Um, or is it just, you know, I saw somewhere strong drink. Okay, the, the idea is don't get drunk for sure. Right? Don't get, let's put that, don't get drunk. Don't engage in, you know, strong drink. Don't drink, you know, at the very least, you shouldn't be drinking, you know, hard liquor. Don't be getting drunk. You know, do they completely abstain from alcohol? That probably varies just like, you know, what particular beliefs each, you know, Buddhist believes in. And maybe their degree of indulgence in alcohol varies as well. But there is this general emphasis on, you know, certainly don't get drunk. Don't, don't engage in drunkenness. Okay. So that was slide eight. We talked about a lot of the main uh, ideas then that, that stem from the, the Buddhist teaching. Okay. We mentioned earlier, let's go ahead and then transition to slide nine. And the reason why we're discussing this right now, because again, there are a lot of similarities to Aristotle, who will come a couple hundred years later, and the Greek philosopher Aristotle, there are similarities to his moral theory that we just finished discussing in lecture 13, virtue ethics. And so, and I've tried to point out a few of those already. Really, the main one that you know should be evident at this point is compare, for example, the middle way, as the Eightfold Path is oftentimes referred to as, with the Golden Mean. I began the lecture in the introduction talking, or I guess when I was referring to the Buddha and his life, I referenced you know his biography and how he started off living a life of pleasure to a great degree. You know, he was well off and could afford to indulge in various pleasures, but he wasn't satisfied with that. And so he goes off and more or less lives with ascetics and refrains from indulging in pleasures, you know, as much as is possible. And that didn't satisfy him uh, either. And so he eventually settles on the this, this so-called middle way. Don't do things too much. Don't do it too little, right? Don't indulge in pleasures too much, but don't refrain from indulging them at, in them at all. Okay. Well, this sounds very similar to, again, Aristotle's idea of the golden mean, which we discussed at length in the lecture 13 videos. Okay. Don't do things in excess and avoid doing them in a deficient sense. Okay. Always shoot for the moderate amount of them. So I, I put it on the bottom of nine in this way, right? The Buddha found discontent in both the overindulgent life as well as the ascetic life. While one ought not to cater to pleasure all the time, one shouldn't completely neglect one's urges either. So again, he chooses the middle way. As the editors point out, quote, ultimately he settled on a different path, a middle way between aestheticism and the materialistic life of his youth, end quote. All right. So definitely some similarities there. Uh, again, the idea that we need to reflect and appreciate, you know, the things that are becoming problematic to, as well. The whole idea of reflection, of course, that's common with almost all of these philosophers, right? That's an important feature. Let's go ahead and turn our attention then finally to the, here's another thing I don't know how to pronounce. Sutta? sutta? I should have looked this up. I'm going to say sutta. Um which is, I define that on the top of uh, slide 10. So this is from the text, page 92 of our text. A sutta is a Buddhist, this is a quote, a Buddhist text that purports to record a teaching of the Buddha. Okay, so it's purportedly a text that encapsulates, again, what uh, the, the, the Buddha taught. 
I meant to actually shoot. I forgot to do this. I had a so I reread this in the last few days. Um, there was a good quote that I didn't have in the original lecture notes for Nirvana when in the story when they're discussing what is the power of a monk to the very end. You know, and they're kind of describing. So basically, you know, what the good monk looks like. So King, this is how you ought to behave and the things you you sort of ought to do. Uh, and you know what then will be the end result of all this if you act properly you focus on the the middle way and you know act according to the uh the eightfold path well you'll reach you know what is the power of them for a monk right so this is right here page uh 101 of our text so and it's kind of describing that sense of nirvana i felt like when i was reading this so this is again the page 101 quote by the destruction of the corruptions and those unnecessary desires so by destroying those, by the destruction of the, the by the destruction of the corruptions, enters into this the, the monk, enters into it and abides in that corruptionless liberation of heart and liberation by wisdom which he has attained in this very life by his own super knowledge and realization. So by destroying those desire unnecessary desires that were corrupting him, uh, the monk then is able to liberate himself from that immense pain and suffering, and you know be enlightened so to speak and free his being again how you want to put this exactly depends on you know which version of buddhism we're talking about but frees himself from the the, the issues associated with the pain and suffering that were plaguing him before okay, so that's what uh the successful moral agent has to look forward to um, relieving themselves from all this pain and suffering if they successfully focus on again following the the Eiffel path or the middle way. Okay, so, and all of that comes into play then with respect to our sutta, uh, uh, this story that we, we read then for uh, this lecture. You'll see what happens then if you don't follow, right, the middle way or the proper path as set out by um, the Buddha. Okay. So, so real quick recap of what happens, right? We have this original king, really weird with all the years involved and how long these people live. I'm not sure what's going on there. Again, if you are more familiar with Buddhism than, than I am, maybe you have um, an awareness of this or understand why these these people are living for 20,000 and 40,000 and 80,000 years at a time in their lifetime. Then insofar as they start doing, you know, the king doesn't quite do the right thing, then their life is reduced by magnitudes of thousands of years it's strange but anyway uh you know i start off and then you get this um this king right is in power and everything's going smooth what is it called the wheel of treasure the, tre the wheel of treasure i believe and there's a lot of sin again something i'm not well versed in symbolism in buddhism as well and what was it the wheel of treasure i believe uh yeah the wheel wheel treasure at right? the symbol of the wheel and the wheel obviously is very important in this uh, and I know the wheel uh, is very important in Buddhism in general, oftentimes used as a symbol. But this wheel treasure, and there's a bunch of these treasures, but anyway, this wheel treasure is out of position, this king is told. And so then this king realizes, okay, I guess my time's about to expire. And I guess that's what that meant, right? And so he tells his son, you're taking over. So the son takes over, becomes king. And then suddenly the 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 wheel treasure is lost, okay? Uh, and so he's got to kind of figure out, you know, how things for himself. And he he starts off promising, right? He seeks some advice, and he's told that, uh, you know, he has to follow the duty of an Aryan wheel-turning monarch. And so what does that amount to? He tries to follow it, right, as best he can. He seeks the advice of, you know, the sage and so on, and tries to do as best he can, okay? Um, the wheel treasure returns, the, the, the king prospers, the flock returns to him, okay, he's doing well, then the wheel disappears again. Okay, what happened? Well, this time around, he doesn't uh, seek the counsel of the sage and rather does his own, you know, tries to do things of his own accord, right, his own way, not following the Buddha's teaching. Okay, and that's when then things start really spiraling out of control. And what I thought was interesting it was it started with one tiny mistake right one little issue in the wheel here to tune right? we got a big hit a big rock but it was one rock here puts a little dent in our wheel what was the issue 
right? He didn't give property to the needy. And because of that one issue and not feel, following the, the Buddhist teachings in general, then everything spirals out of control. So from that one initial mistake on the part of the king, not seeking right, the advice of the sage and, and so too staying on the path, right, the, the middle path and following the advice of the Buddha and carrying out his, instead his own sort of ideas, he then makes a mistake. Uh, doesn't give property to the needy and everything spir spirals out of control. So turning to slide 11, we have a, this is a, from the story on 96. This is a quote. So after listening to others give advice, quote, the king established guard and protection, but he did not give property to the needy. And as a result, poverty became rife. So then we got poverty that resulted. So you didn't get, you made this mistake. You didn't give property to the needy, those who were in need. Uh, well then, Boom, poverty becomes rife. With the spread of poverty, a man took what was not given, theft, thus committing what was called theft on 96. And so, you know, one thing leads to another. There's that idea of karma. Boom, boom, boom. And of course, you know, you're, you're not anticipating all this. And so to remedy this initial ill, quote, the king gave the man some property. Here, let me fix this, take this. But then what ends up happening, excuse me, other people see this. Hey, if I take stuff, or sorry, if I, uh, if I, um, you know, don't have anything, then the king will just, you know, give me something in the end, right? Even if I take something. Okay, so to re again, to rem remedy this initial ill, to quote, the king gave the man some property, but then, quote, people heard that the king was giving away property to those who took what was not given. And they thought, suppose we were to do likewise, end quote. So that was the issue, right? He tried to fix it. He, he, he kind of, you feel sorry for him, right? He seems to be trying to do the right thing. But and then doing this and giving the guy who the whole problem stemmed from, again, not being helped out when he could have been helped out. He had to steal them just to survive. And then what the king do? Well, he gave him something even after he stole. And then other people see this and it sets a precedent. OK, well, it's OK to steal and then get something from the king. So this initial error on the part of the king, not giving to the needy ultimately leads to them theft, lying, gossip, envy, you name it. Like if it's an issue or an ill it ends up happening then. Okay. Harsh speech, idle chatter, covetedness, hatred, false opinions, incest, excessive greed, right? This is all delineated as then issues that confront his kingdom. Okay. And a lack, ultimately, a lack of respect for reputable people, right? And ultimately, a complete lack of morality in some sense. So at this point, the wrong people are honored and respected. Hate and anger dominate people's mindsets. And again, morality is completely lagging or immorality is rampant. Uh, turning to slide 12, this is from page 98 of the text. Quote, there will be no word for moral, so how can there be anyone who acts in a moral way? Those people, people who have no respect for mother or father, for ascetics and Brahmins, in other words, for wise, wise men, for the head of the clan will be the ones who enjoy honor and prestige. Everything will be flipped on its head, right? Those who should be garnering respect will be laughed and ridiculed, and then those who are doing all the wrong things will be the ones lauded and held in high regard. Okay? Fortunately, there are some, I guess, that are wiser than others. They retreat, they reflect and realize we got to do something about this. All right. And then they begin by not taking life. Hey, let's not treat each other this crappy way. Let's not hurt each other. And then by doing that one good thing, then everything sort of fixes itself then. Right. Through this one good act, initial act, then we then get no theft, no sexual misconduct. Right. And everything sort of fixes itself and everything gets back to normal. To the way they started. So as I alluded to to begin with, it seems to stress this whole story, I would argue, seems to stress the significance of maintaining all aspects of our well-being. If there's even one sort of element of our nature that's uh, got an issue, well then that can lead to all sorts of issues. Given our interconnectedness and how everything is interconnected, that one kink in the armor, so to speak, will lead to the downfall of everything. So our well-being, as I put it in the bottom of 12, our well-being is like a wheel. If it gets compromised in any particular area, it very well might be compromised in its entirety. Interesting story, I thought. Um, you know, I, I, again, I felt a lot of sympathy throughout for, for the king. He seems to be trying to do the right thing. And that's maybe ultimately why everything he sort of, sort of um, rectified in the end, I guess. Right? He is at least trying to do the right thing for a while and 
you lose the sight of the path and that's when things you know explode for him but um once you get kind of going back onto the path then again not, not all hope is lost focus on the middle way or aristotle's golden mean alternatively and, and you can still mitigate pain and suffering or at least to the best to the best of our abilities the best that we can there's a sense in which maybe we'll never be able to completely eliminate pain and suffering maybe it's impossible but what the buddhists encourage us, us to do is to acknowledge nonetheless the extent to which that is an issue for us and then to try to mitigate it or eliminate it as much as we can okay so turning to reflection time we'll go ahead and conclude here what do you think of buddhism what do you think of it in terms of a moral theory given what the buddha has to tell us these ideas about reality and how pain and suffering play a huge role and then what we ought to do in turn do you think the buddhist the Buddhists offer us enough to figure out what we ought to do in moral dilemmas, you know, to figure out whether abortion is right or wrong or these various moral dilemmas. You know, do they give us enough to work with? And, you know, the moral precepts don't harm life. I guess it depends on how you define life. Right. Um, do, they, do they give us enough to work with to flesh out some of those moral issues or moral dilemmas? So that's question one. What is most important is question two, morally speaking. Uh, how would they approach then, given what's most important? For the Buddhist, how would they approach some of these moral dilemmas? What do you think they would focus on when trying to approach the dilemma of abortion and death penalty and so on? And what do you make of this emphasis on the part of the, the Buddhist on pain and suffering? Does that seem like a good place to start off when figuring out what we ought to do? Uh, is that a good place to start? Well, this pain and suffering seems to plague so many of us in so many aspects of our life. Let's then, the job of the moral agent, let's say then, is to extinguish that expunge that as much as possible does that seem like what we mean when we say talk about morality is that the job of morality to uh, do whatever is possible to again eliminate pain and suffering that's what the buddhist seems to suggest and then what do you think of that sutta i didn't even attempt to pronounce the name of the one we read there it is okay. what'd you think of it what conclusions did you draw from it okay. That's it. When we reconvene for lecture 15, we'll, we'll talk about Plato, another ancient philosopher, Aristotle's teacher. We'll talk about Plato and then Socrates as well. Uh, Socrates is Plato's teacher. We'll talk a very, about a very famous passage from the Republic, probably arguably the most famous book in philosophy of all time. Uh, the Ring and Guide Jesus uh, excerpt from the Republic, book two of the Republic. So famous passage from book two of the Republic, book two meaning chapter two of the Republic. So we'll home in on that, talk about what Socrates and Pals have to say about morality in Plato's Republic. So stay tuned. That's in lecture 15. Until then, bye-bye.